Yes. Uh, Mayor Donches? Mike Peterson? Here. Scott LeClaire? Adam Varley? Here. Maggie Harper? Here. Alderman Clee? Dan Hudson? Here. Bob Bollinger? Here. Larry Hirsch? Here. And Alderman Tebow? I'm just noticing that Bob had one of my phones. Oh. Take, take mine. Yeah, we can share one. Here it comes. <laughs> Here you go. Enjoy it. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Asking you shall receive. All right. <laughs> okay, uh, so we have a quorum. Um, next up on the agenda, we have uh, approval of minutes from the September 21st meeting. Has anyone had an opportunity to review the minutes and willing to make a motion, or are there any comments on the minutes? Mr. Hirsch? Move to accept the minutes as written. Motion by Mr. Hirsch to accept the minutes as written. Is there a second? Second. Second by Mr. Bollinger. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? No. Okay, that motion passes. Communications? We do not have any. Right. <laughs> All right, well that's easy. Uh, report of committee and liaison. Harper, anything to report? Um, the historical commission meeting was actually canceled um, this week. We did not have any cases. Okay. Great. Okay. Um, given that we do not have any regular cases on the agenda, only um, referrals and other business, I'm, I'm going to skip the reading of the procedure other than to say as to the referral matters, we will, of course, accept public comment to the extent there is any. Um, so with respect to the old business subdivision plans and old business site plans, I would just note that the, the four cases all related to the Mohawk Tannery site have been tabled until our December 7th, 2023 meeting. Um, so we, as I said, we have no regular items on the agenda, so we'll move right to other business. Um, so the first item on, under other business is a review of the tentative agenda to determine proposals of regional impact. So has anyone had a chance to review the tentative agenda and have a view one way or the other? Uh, Mr. Bollinger? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes, um, I'd like to make a recommendation that there are no projects of regional impact based on the Technical Review Committee meeting of October 16th, 2023. Okay, uh, so that motion by Mr. Bollinger is that uh, there are no proposals of regional impact reflected on the tentative agenda. Is there a second? Second by Mr. Hirsch. Uh, any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? That motion passes unanimously. Okay, next up under other business, we have referral of R-23-0163, authorizing the City of Nashville to grant an easement to public service of New Hampshire, DBA Eversource Energy for tax map 43, lot 105 and 106. And understand If you could just please state your name and address for the record, that'd be great. Uh, sure, Donald Stokes, uh, representing the Eversource uh, Community Relations, um, addressed 96 River Road, Manchester, New Hampshire, uh, 276 Amherst Street here in Nashua. Um, yeah, this easement is basically, uh, we cannot access uh, or easily access a lot of the poles over in the inner walk walkway, and our plan is usually to put all those poles on the ground uh, for uh, safety and also for so that we can better access for all operations for emergency response and for upgrades. Uh, and so that's just the uh, just uh, why we are requesting this easement from the city. Okay. Any questions? Questions? Seems fairly straightforward, Mr. Hirsch. Is, this is on the uh, the two seventy six Amherst Street property. No, no, no. This is, uh, that's our where our area work center is. This right. is over. Uh, by Margaritas off of the Nashua Drive, uh, Canal Street area. I think we're all set. All right. All right. Thank you. Okay, so again, this is, a, this is a referral from the Board of Aldermen. So our, um, our obligation here is to, to make a referral, favorable, unfavorable, 
um, or you know, with with comment back to the Board of Aldermen. This seems pretty straightforward. Um, grant of easement sounds like to, to allow for underground easily, which is something we're encouraging in any event. So um, seems like it would be uh, reasonable to make a favorable recommendation here. But Mr. Hudson, did you want to add something? Uh, yeah, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Just I, I just want to tell the board I'm familiar with this. This is related to the Riverfront project. Uh, city has a very small triangular piece, kind of abutted by um, you know, Margarita's property and then the uh, railroad and whatnot, and it's right, right next to the river. And, um, and coordinating with them and um, wanting to have them accomplish some utility work down there, uh, granting this easement is, is needed. And it's been a while in the works, but it's finally been negotiated. I know legal was satisfied with the language, so I would just. Uh, from the board, I think it's appropriate to move forward with it. Okay, great. With that, is someone uh, interested in willing to make a motion? Um, Mr. Chair. Mr. Bollinger. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I'd like to make a motion uh, that the planning board <coughs> grant a uh, favorable recommendation uh, regarding resolution R23-163 uh, authorizing city to grant an easement to PSNH uh, DBA Eversource Energy for the uh, two subject lots uh, as requested. Thank you. So a uh, motion by Mr. Bollinger to make a favorable recommendation on R-23-0163. Is there a second? Uh, second by <laughs> Mr. Hirsch. We had a sort of same time there, all right. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? That motion passes. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, next up we have a referral of O-23-062, amending the land use code regarding wetlands buffer for vernal pools. And I understand it speaks to this as well. Uh, hello, uh, my name is Sherry Dutsey, 18 Sword Terrace, Nashua, uh, and I'm here on behalf of the Nashua Conservation Commission. Um, we requested um, that Alderman uh, Jetty and Alderman uh, Dodd put, uh, Dowd, um, put this change forward. Uh, currently, the buffer for vernal pools is uh, 20 feet, and we're asking for uh, a 100 foot buffer. I believe the uh, Army Corps of Engineers uh, even goes up to like a 400 foot buffer um, to protect um, the species that uh, take advantage of a vernal pool. I am not an expert on that, but uh, we do have a friend of the Conservation Commission uh, who can speak to uh, the species who live in a vernal pool and why uh, having a protective buffer, an increase in the protective buffer, uh, is important. Does okay. oh, anybody have any other questions for me? Or? I, I just, just out of curiosity, not, I don't know if you know the answer to this, but how does this, oh, actually, never mind, I'm seeing it right here. So it's a, for prime wetlands, it's a 75-foot buffer, and so this would be. Is that what, it, is that what was uh, put forward, was a 75-foot buffer? Uh, I'm, I'm saying that I, I was just comparing it to what the the other buffer the, standards okay, yeah, were, and so for the vernal pool, wetland is 75. I believe right. we're asking for 100. You're at, yes, that's correct. Yeah, it's 100 <coughs> is the proposal for the vernal pools. Um, so I was just going to ask if you knew what the what the buffer was for the prime wetlands, but then I saw it in the yeah. in the ordinance. So uh, questions, Mr. Hirsch. Yeah. Uh, any, has anyone had a calculation of how much land will be taken out of use basically by this? Any land be not developable? Is there any kind of calculation? For example, you go over 20 to 100 feet <coughs> of a buffer. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, Mr. Hirsch. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah, oh. I'm hard of hearing. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm, yes. I should have been more careful. I apologize. No. Has anyone done a calculation about the acreage that would be involved that can no longer be developed or used around? It's a major increase going from 20 to 100 feet. And I'm, just, I'm a little bit confused about why, <coughs> why, why such a large uh, change. Uh, and I'm a little bit concerned also about the economic, economic impact to landowners. Uh, uh, has anyone no, done I, a, don't, I don't believe anybody has, has done that. So we don't really know the implications at the end of the day. And these are vernal pools, which I understand are seasonal. Well, I mean, you, 
as opposed to prime wetlands? I would say, you know, that most of the vernal pools that, that we've identified have either been on conservation land or um, they've been on city land such as um, the, the new school, um, the McCarthy School. I believe they have um, several vernal pools there. Yeah, I don't, we, I don't think we have ever had any Thing come forward where there's been a vernal pool on a pro on a piece of private property. I'm trying to think. But we don't really no one has anyone ever ever found out how many no. vernal pools no, there as are. Far as I know, so we really don't know the implications of what we're recommending, the economic implications. And again, going from 20 to 100 feet is quite a change. Uh, and if the prime wetlands are only 75 feet. <clears throat> There may be an economic impact, that's true, okay? But I mean, the, the real issue and what the Conservation Commission is concerned about is the protecting of the species that are, um, that are part of the vernal pool. And, and studies have shown that 20 feet, I mean, because the species, um, fairy shrimp and spotted salamander um, and various frogs, will uh, breed in a vernal pool and then you know, they, they move out of the vernal pool and to upland areas, okay, after, after the breeding session, se season, and you just need more areas of protection so that they can raise their young and be, you know, be part of the ecosystem. So would there be an, could there be an economic impact um, I imagine there could be, but then again, you know, do you want development within 20 feet of a vernal pool? And the reason we have critical buffers and critical wetland buffers and prime wetland buffers is because we know that those are um, habitats that need to be product need to be product protected. So I mean, you could say the same thing about our prime wetlands. Um, I mean, you know, why, why have a prime wetland buffer? Why not just develop right up to the water's edge? Right, but what's at issue here is the, the issue of the vernal, the vernal pools. And my only concern is it doesn't seem like it's, from what you're telling me, anyone's really evaluated how many pools are involved and what the overall implica implications might be. And also the difference between 20 feet and maybe 40 or 60 or 80 feet or 100 feet. I, I just don't, it seems, it, it, like not totally thought through, unless I'm missing a lot on this. I'm sorry, say that it, it, it seems like the, the project, this this resolution hasn't been thought through completely, because I'm not hearing any any analysis or any kind of basic information. Uh, can, can can I ask a question of staff? Might, Mary, oh, sorry. Might have some information on that. There there could be. Um, Mary Lou, is there any analysis that's been done by the Army Corps of Engineers? And do you want to speak sure, to that? Come on. Sure. Yeah, I mean. Sure. I mean, because this is not, and this is not a new concept. And like I say, I mean, the, the Army Corps actually recommends a 400-foot buffer uh, for protection. But if you want to speak, uh, the near, uh, yeah, Mary Lou knows more of the uh, specifics. Um, hi, my name is Mary Lou Sozek, uh, 15 Rocky Hill Drive, Nashua. I'm a conservation biologist. I've helped Sherry and other members of the commission with various uh, uh, walks and talks and stuff. Basically, I can speak a little bit to the economic impact. The vernal pools are typically very small. You know, they're not even a third of an acre big. Right, I mean, they're, they're pretty small, so a 20-foot buffer around the edge of a fairly small pool doesn't provide a lot of protection for the uh, frogs and salamanders going in and out of it. And ex expanding that to 100 feet, which is in line with uh, all the recommendations of other uh, with Army Corps of Engineers, uh, other conservation organizations, will just give them a little bit more breathing room free from disturbance. And I, you know, again, I, I don't think, I don't know of any uh, studies that have 
calculated what the additional uh, <coughs> square footage or acreage around, but I don't think it would be that large because the pools themselves are not that large. Just, I, I just had a quick question for staff on this. So, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but is the the wetland buffer restriction is something that is within the discretion of the planning board to modify. So could the planning board allow on a particular, on a case by case gate basis impact within the buffer? Well, actually, uh, you'd still be following the uh, special exception as you would for the prime wetlands and others. So, and I think just, just from my experience, 125 is not, not unusual for vernal pools because of the upland species. That helps. So, so just to, yeah. to confirm, then it would be a special special exception before the zoning board would be the the remedy if Release. someone wanted. Right. Okay. Check with Carter. Mr. Peterson. Uh, I received an email today from a resident of Nashua regarding this ordinance, and in it was a PDF file entitled "Vernal Pool Best Practice Best Management Practices." issued by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, New England District, and in it they go through all this, and uh, their best practice recommendation is uh, 100 feet up to 750 feet. So they're recommending 100 feet minimum uh, of, of, of radius or of clearance around the vernal pool from the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. I didn't realize that. Mr. Hirsch? Yeah, I, I didn't realize the Army Corps of Engineers dealt with the vernal pools. I thought it was just navigable waterways. I learned that today. Yeah, that's something. Okay. And that's a minimum, is there minimum distance away? Yeah. 100 is what they're recommend, recommending. Such as uh, they said, sometimes the salamanders mm -hmm. need to like travel away, then come back. Ms. Um, just a question, because I'm, I'm sorry I'm not very familiar with vernal pools. I mean, the animals I am, but what, like, what constitutes a vernal pool versus, you know, a, lack of better words, a large puddle from a lot of rain in the spring? Like, what's, okay. what's the difference? Um, a vernal pool has particular uh, water quality issues, I mean, uh, characteristics, not issues. Uh, it's shallow enough that fish can't live there year round. Some vernal pools will completely dry up, others will just shrink. And the lack of fish who are predators to the other animals um, just prevents predation and allows the salamanders and wood frogs to, uh, to reproduce. Um, there can be puddles <laughs> that form in the spring that don't support these species, and they can dry up too. So really the definition of a vernal pool is a seasonal wetland that has these species in them. There can be a, a similar area that looks a lot like it, but for some reason unknown to us, these species don't go into that puddle. So, I, I don't know what more to say. Uh, it's just, it, it's just the uh, repeated use of this little depression in the soil that supports these species. And there's great site fidelity after breeding. The young will come back to the same vernal pool, and that's why protection of them is is important. There have been uh, attempts to create vernal pools by making little depressions in the soils, and that has not succeeded. So there, that's one of the reasons why it's important to protect the ones that we know we have, because you can't, you can't create a, a vernal pool. It's just something of uh, particular characteristics in the forest that promote 
this retention of water. So then, I'm sorry, a follow-up question. So are, have these bodies of water been I identified already, or? Many of them have, yeah. <clears throat> I mean, uh, there was a survey done on some of the conservation units, and then I have the school property that Sherry mentioned, um, a wetland scientist identified the vernal pools, and I've been in, I've been to several of them, and you can you can tell that they're active because in the spring you can see the egg masses of the salamanders, and you can hear the wood frogs chirping. They uh, they sound almost like ducks quacking. And uh, well, I guess the reason I'm asking is because as far as you know, ma mandating something like this, if someone comes in September to get approval on something, then it wouldn't. You, you, right. In, in okay. September, you would not be able to tell if something is a vernal pool, except sometimes there are certain species of clams that will only live in these uh, temporary wetlands. Um, I know it's crazy. Maybe they just bury and burrow into the, the mud. And if you can see those shells along the edges of what well, a dried up pool, you can say, yeah, this is really a vernal pool, but it's very, it's generally difficult to determine a vernal pool when there's not water and when it's not in the springtime. So the, the process, I mean, the process that normally happens for the Conservation Commission is that you have undeveloped land, um, a developer wants to develop it, and they recognize that there are wetlands on that property, okay? And so before they come before the Conservation Commission, they have a wetland scientist go out and evaluate all of the, the wetland areas. Um, if a wetland scientist suspects that there's a vernal pool, you know, then that's identified. But the scientists, sometimes they just suspect it, and it's the time of the year when they can't verify it. So they can come back a lot of times. In fact, this is what we had happen uh, with McCarthy School. They came back a year later, and I, I can't remember. I thought we had like seven <coughs> vernal pools or something. And so suspected, and then they came back, and they identified the vernal pools that were viable and the other ones um, that were not considered to be viable or, you know, were, were not, you know, considered to be in, important. Um, and then what normally happens is when those are identified, whatever the um, developer is going to do, they develop around those areas and they design around those areas. And what we've seen is that normally there's enough property that, you know, it's, it, it hasn't been an issue. Um, I, I honestly, I mean, I honestly don't know if we would ever um, recognize a vernal pool on a piece of private property because unless they wanted to develop it, it wouldn't, it wouldn't come before us. Okay, so I mean, you know, at, at that point, I'm, I'm not <coughs> sure. I mean, if we, can't, if we don't identify it, then, you know, we don't really know about it. And, and the reason, I mean, the vernal pools are very special. Um, and it is, you know, there's no fish. Uh, they're home to only certain um, uh, species um, that live in a vernal pool, and they have no inlets and no outlets. Um, okay, and that's, um, that's, you know, how they're identified. So I, I honestly don't think it's going to affect a lot in Nashua, uh, but the vernal pools that we have, we really should um, protect them and, and conserve them, and the 100 foot buffer will do that. Mr. Peterson. Uh, question for the applicant. Um, do turtles and birds utilize vernal pools as far as, as far as their life cycle goes? Very minimally, no. I mean, I wouldn't put it past a great blue heron to come by and snatch up a salamander, but it's not a, uh, a typical habitat. And the turtles need, you know, uh, water that's moving and a, a much larger amount of water. Thank you. 
Mr. Hirsch. Yeah. How, how do the vernal pools differ from the prime wetlands, the different classifications? Is, are, are a lot of these species also in the prime wetlands, or are no. they only in the vernal pools? Um, they're, they're only in the, the vernal pools <coughs> because in other wetlands they'd be predated upon. So these are um, species that rely on very protected, secluded areas. Is there a rationale for having uh, a wider radius, a buffer, wider buffer around vernal pools as opposed to the prime wetlands? It would seem like the prime wetlands would be your bigger concern. I, I don't know. I mean, yeah. yeah, well, I would say yes because, you know, in a, in a prime wetland, um, you know, like let's say along um, Salmon Brook, uh, there's different species that are in there. And the whole issue with the species that live in the vernal pool is that after they breed, they move upland. Okay, so for a fish or a turtle or a heron or whatever along Salmon Brook, you know, that's their, their habitat. But the issue in the vernal pool is that the species move. And that's why you want to have that protected area <coughs> so that, um, you know, as the young come out, um, they, um, they have an area where there wouldn't be bikes or walkers or w w whatever. Thank you. Mm -hmm. <coughs> so uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Just a couple things. Uh, in that document that uh, Mr. Peterson was referencing, it does, part of the diagram, one of the diagrams it has, it shows a circle, which is a buffer around the pool, I guess, and it talks about not developing within more than like a quarter of the circle that surrounds it. In other words, it's not, it appears it's not a full boat buffer with no impact anticipated, um, if I'm reading it right. But again, I'm just, I just Googled it and I'm just looking at what he was looking at. Um, I would note that 100 foot circle is 0.7 acres, if I did my calculation correctly. So if the pool was zero, feet in uh, size, you'd have a 3.7 acre area that would be protected. So if it gets up to, you know, as was noted, a third of an acre or whatever or less, um, it's going to be a pretty big area. Yeah, that's my concern. Um, mm -hmm. And my concern is not so much for the big subdivisions, that sort of thing, but more for the individual homeowners. I just don't know how that affects, <coughs> affects development on their lots. So, um, but, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think the, the reality, though, is that if you're talking about a smaller lot, even with a 20-foot buffer, it, it's going to be impactful. Um, and, you know, ultimately, like any other zoning requirement, you know, the homeowner would have, you know, the opportunity to seek a remedy before the zoning board for a special exception. Um, I, I mean... I don't, I don't see any, you know, developers here, um, you know, who are expressing concern about this. And given that there is ultimately a remedy and that this is, you know, a, a, apparently a, <laughs> an, you know, recommendation by people who are expert in this field, you know, I would be inclined not to, to second guess that judgment. Um, you know, and, and so be more inclined to make a favorable recommendation, but I'm obviously happy to go with whatever the board is inclined to. I, I just feel a mandate like this potentially would take a huge amount of land, you know, potential of private, you know, land, not, not necessarily conservation land, but other land out, out of use, basically out of, out of development potential. And I think to have that kind of a broad uh, mandate, like you say, seven tenths of an acre, you know, is, is an awful lot of land. I, I just don't think, and without understanding the impacts, we don't know if there are, you know, uh, 100, 1,000, 10,000 vernal uh, pools in the city, for example. Uh, we have no idea. Uh, and I don't think, from what I'm hearing, I just, I don't think we should give a carte blanche to say, okay, anything beyond that 100 feet is all you can do, work with. Yeah, I mean, I, it, I, just to be clear, I mean, there, it is, we're not talking about creating a standard, it's an existing buffer of 20 feet, so it's about, you know, so it's not as if it's not, there's no impact now. Um, but again, I, I guess I would say if let's, if, if there's a desire to make a motion, let's make a motion favorable or unfavorable 
um, and we can always discuss further. But uh, you know, I, I think I think it'd be good to make a motion at this point. Can, can I just add? Oh. Oh. Yes, go ahead. I just uh, we just recently updated our natural resources inventory through the uh, uh, National Regional Planning Commission. And we've been working on all of the maps uh, there to identify uh, the wetland areas, okay? And of course, you know, a vernal open spaces and, I mean, various maps, open spaces and, and wetland areas, okay? So those really have been um, identified um, through the natural resources inventory. Now, obviously, you know, we didn't go into people's backyards, but I mean, the chances you know, um, the, the chances of there being a vernal pool in somebody's backyard, um, I mean, it's just, I mean, I can't even fathom it, versus what we come across all the time, you know, our homes that have been built in the wetland buffer, okay? And I mean, we, we come across, not uncommon for us to come across a house where half of the house has been built in the wetland buffer. Okay, and there's some violation because they took down a tree and, and didn't realize it. I mean, that's pretty common. So, um, you know, I, uh, I haven't, we've been working on the maps to make them more granular. You know, we recognize that all maps, you know, none of the maps are like perfect, you know, uh, because things change in terms of erosion and where rivers move and that type of thing. But, um, <coughs> As far as you know, the, the majority of the wetlands in Nashua, they've been mapped out, so we do know that. But I've never, I mean, you know, I've been on the commission now almost 10 years. I've ne never heard of a vernal pool um, that's basically in, in somebody's backyard. Mr. Peterson. Um, regarding um, Mr. Hirsch's uh, concern, um, the change to the ordinance says uh, vernal pool boundaries to be determined by a certified wetlands scientist, buffer boundary to be determined by certified wetland scientist or licensed land surveyor. So on a case by case basis, they will evaluate, you know, what, what the buffer should be. It's not like a fixed hundred foot, you know, radius all around. Did I misunderstand the, I thought it was a, Regardless, I thought it was 100 feet. I haven't had a chance. To, I haven't read that. I don't know. Well, it's it's, it's in the ordinance. It's, it's um, 100 feet. I think it's it's. But the the point is, I think what Mr. Peterson is saying is, it's that wetland scientist would determine sort of where the 100 feet begins and ends. Yeah. Yeah, because things aren't so in a perfect circle. Feet. You know, right. you, you have to like yeah. see where the water goes. Okay. Is is someone interested in making a motion? Again. Re, just a reminder, all we're doing is making a favorable or unfavorable recommendation here to the Board of Aldermen, or we could make a recommendation favorable or unfavorable with comment. Mr. Chair, I, I'd be happy to do so, but I, Mr. Hudson, I'm sorry, did you have anything no, else to add? I'm sorry, I, I yeah. thought I saw your hand yeah. go up. So. I'll put my, it's off, like an auction, I'll put my hands down. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, for, for, for discussion. Um, I, Mr. 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 Chair, yes. Um, uh, I'd like to make a motion to make a favorable recommendation regarding Ordinance 023-062, uh, amending land use code regarding well and buffer for vernal pools. Thank you, Mr. Bollinger. So um, that is a, a motion for a favorable recommendation on 0-23-062. Uh, is there a second to that motion? Seconded by Mr. Peterson, and now I would open it up for further discussion. Um, Mr. Bollinger. I, I, I guess maybe just to, to bolster some of the thought behind my, my um, favorable recommendation, um, it looks like a lot of the larger undeveloped parcels within Nashua are either city-owned or we're already aware of them with some degree of development potential. I'm thinking of uh, perhaps the Flatley parcels west of the Turnpike, um, uh, or maybe a handful of others, but I, I think the largest impact would be to those larger parcels. Um, 
I, I do agree with the sentiments that, that you spoke of earlier, Mr. Varley, um, regarding a smaller parcel, um, whether you have a, a quarter of acre or something like that. I, I, I think the likelihood of having this impact you is far, far less. And if you if you supplement that with the fact that there there is a, a path to remediation um, via via zoning relief, um, I. I don't see this as particularly burdensome. I, I think given the level of development that we've already seen in Nashua, I, I think if you were trying to, to pass this um, uh, in, a, in a more rural, undeveloped community, I think that's potentially limiting development potential to a far larger degree if you were, say, Hollis or Brookline. Um, but I, I, I think given what's already built out here, um, I, I personally feel that it's, it's not it's not unduly restrictive. Mr. Hirsch? I respectfully disagree. I feel that you're putting in place uh, something where we can't predict the uh, impacts. We don't know really what is out there. No one's categorized. No one's, you know, it could be anywhere. It's one thing you're going to do on conservation land or whatever, that's fine, or city owned land, but I think to subject private landowners to that's unreasonable. Other comments? Okay, so we've got the motion from Mr. Bollinger for, to make a favorable recommendation. We've got a second from Mr. Peterson. Um, so I will call the question. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Sir, so uh, that motion passes with five yeas and one nay. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, so next up on the other business is um, the review of the 2024 meeting dates. And typically what we do, you know, the historical practice here has been everybody sort of takes this back, you know, reviews it, uh, evaluates whether there's any um, dates that might be concerning. And then we'll come back at the next meeting and then and finalize the schedule. Good Mr. Chair. Mr. Bollinger. A after a quick glance, I, I didn't see anything that really struck out. We, we missed February vacation, April vacation, <laughs> and uh, Fourth of July weekend. So I, 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 I think barring that. We've had a lot of practice. Those are usually, <laughs> those are usually the, the sticking points, yeah. uh, those, those three. So yes. Um, but the, obviously, I, I, if we'd like to push this to another date, that's that's fine. But. Uh, yeah, and I, I agree with you. It's, I, I doubt we're going to need to change anything, but just to give everybody the chance to, so you know, we're not looking at it right now because I don't think there's any, I don't think we there's no immediate urgency, right? If we wait, so the, next meeting will be yeah. good. Okay. All right. Um, next up, then we have the discussion items. The uh, item number one: revision of the sidewalk. Payment and loan fee. Um, Dan, I don't know. Was I, I know we sort of had left this off for further thinking. I, I think was the idea last time. So yeah, we're, um, we're still in the same place. I still need to gather some additional data about what other communities doing. I did talk to Concord, New Hampshire today. Uh, basically, there in lieu would be to do a calculation um, what the what the cost of that piece of sidewalk will be, and then a full contribution in lieu of. But that's just one data point, so I'm going to continue to gather more and be back with the board with additional information. Okay, sounds good. And then the last item was the uh, review of the, the bylaws and procedures. Again, this was the issue that we had brought to the table last meeting, um, and I know staff has s sent around some proposed revisions, but um, Scott did ask if we could hold off on discussing this until the next meeting when he'll be here again, um, which I said, you, you know, I thought was fine. We can, I don't, again, I don't think there's any tremendous urgency to this one. So, um, so as long as no one objects, I think we just push that off until the next meeting. Okay. All right. Um, any other discussion items? Not on the agenda. All right. In that case, um, I will take a motion to adjourn from someone.
Mr. Bollinger? Uh, yes, Mr. Chair, I'd like to make a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn by Mr. Bollinger. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? That motion passes. And we are adjourned at 742. Ooh.